Extreme E is an all-electric off-road racing series that's touring the planet and bringing awareness to climate change impacted areas, including here in Sardinia. Now I'd like nothing more than to get along and watch one of these races, but there's a problem. Encouraging people to get in planes and jump in cars to come and watch isn't exactly the most environmentally sensitive thing to do. But I've got a plan. This is the Cupra 4 Mentor, and as you can see, it's a small SUV with plenty of ground clearance for tackling some more unsealed roads like this. But it's also a performance car, which means it should be more fun on some of the twisting mountain roads too. But most importantly, this particular version is a plug-in hybrid, which means my carbon footprint is a little bit smaller, and it's a little bit more in keeping with the Extreme E ethos. But before that, let's have a little look around. Cooper is doing a brilliant job standing itself apart from the crowd with unmistakable styling. And just look at the front end of the Formento. It's super aggressive. Loads of nice design details, starting with these headlights. When those are on, there's a really nice sharp LED, sort of like a paperclip design in there. And if you look closer still, there's lots of lovely little textures here and there. Overall, there's a gloss black design and styling theme with this one, including that really aggressive shaped front grille. And in the center of it all is the Cupra Copper Badge. That's what Cupra means, apparently. You'll find copper highlights everywhere throughout this car and other Cupra models. On this wheel trim, they're 19 inch wheels on this, wrapped in Goodyear rubber. That's a more road focused tire, so we'll have to see how that goes on on some of these unsealed trails. But the proportions are really nice. A more coupe elegant SUV, more gloss black highlights down the side. On this side, you'll find a fuel filler flap, but on the other side at the front, you'll find the charge socket because this is a plug-in hybrid. You can charge it at home or wherever you like. And at the back end, more styling touches I absolutely love, like this continuous light bar from the two LED light clusters on either side. Tailpipes, no. Fake trims, unfortunately. You know how I feel about those and more Cupra copper highlights here. In the tail end there, you'll find a slightly smaller boot than some of the other Formento models, because this is a hybrid, 330 liters, because there's a battery underneath the boot floor. But there's more styling touches and design highlights to look at on the inside. What I love most about the cabin of the Formentor is there's enough practical and comfort features to realize that this is definitely related to plenty of other Volkswagen and Audi models, but then there's tons of unapologetic styling to set it apart as well. Obviously, you'll find tons more of those copper highlights. There's stitching on the dashboard, the steering wheel center badge, more stitching on these lovely sports seats. Um, but then there's other really clever things, like I love this continuous LED light accent that goes from one side through the door trims via the dash. At night, that's blue, but then if you do things like hit the hazard lights, that will pulse amber, and it also serves as your blind spot warning in the door trims. Clever thinking, but stylish as well. The driver's seat is electrically operated, passenger seat is manual, there's loads of USB-C charging, heated steering wheel, heated seats, huge panoramic sunroof. It feels like a premium place, but with good design touches to set it apart as well. But I'm in Sardinia, in a high performance car, you know what has to happen next. You can get a Formentor with a far more conventional powertrain, but this one is the PHEV, which means you can plug it in at home or at work and charge quite a decent sized lithium ion battery. With a full charge, it'll give you about 60 kilometers of range, which let's be honest, for most people, is more than enough to do your daily commute. But when you come somewhere like this and you've got slightly longer journeys to do, then that four cylinder turbocharged petrol engine can cut in and lend a hand. So it's really like two cars in one. When that battery is completely exhausted though, it keeps a little bit in reserve and you can constantly get that little extra electric assistance just when you need it. It's never really completely drained. And when you're going downhills like this, there's regenerative braking. And on one particularly long downhill section, I managed to top up the battery with 10%. So it's actually quite effective. Pulling away in traffic, I love that instant electrical torque. It won't stay there forever, but then once you're up and running, the turbocharged petrol engine comes in and lends a hand as well. 
The combination of electric and petrol is quite smooth. There's a few little niggles. Sometimes it does feel a bit strange in the handover between electric and petrol, but generally speaking, it's quite a good marriage. Cupra seems to be establishing itself as a bit of an expert in chassis and steering, and I'm really happy that the plug-in hybrid version of the Formentor is no exception. Now, you might remember I did a video with the Cupra Leon 300 a few weeks back, and that had the most beautiful chassis system and a really, really communicative steering system as well. Formentor actually feels very closely related. There's a bit more body roll, as you might expect, from a high-riding SUV, but the steering is so sharp and perfect for roads like this. I'm actually really surprised how good the condition of roads are in Sardinia. The maintenance program is arguably a lot better than some places in Australia, which I'm surprised at. But it's great fun pushing this around some of the, uh, the more challenging corners. I'm not driving like a maniac because that would spoil that amazing view. I'm saving time to enjoy that as well. Perhaps my biggest bugbear with the drive of the Formentor is, you probably guessed it, the brake pedal. Yes, regenerative braking often mars the feeling of a nice firm brake pedal. It is quite positive once you get really stuck into it, but that first little bit feels a bit squashy. And one of my other favorite features is the way this thing sounds. At low speed when it's electric only, it's got this eerie kind of hum, which has people genuinely turning around and craning their necks to see what it actually is. It's quite a strange but likable sound. And then when the engine cuts in, it's got a really good solid sound. It's only a small four cylinder, but it's a really solid unit and has a good gutsy power delivery, nice low down torque, but it also is quite happy to rev. With a plug-in hybrid powertrain, the Formentor really establishes what is so important about plug-in hybrids. For me, this car would be perfect for the weekly commute. I don't go further than 60 kilometers in each direction, but when you get on longer days like this, road trips in spectacular places, need a little bit of extra ground clearance maybe, then this does it too. In the transition to full electric vehicles, cars like this, and the choice is growing, are really proving that EVs for many people will do, but in the transition towards them, a plug-in hybrid is exactly the way to go. This particular version is at the entry point of the plug-ins, with 150 kilowatts of power and 350 newton meters, enough to get to 100 from standstill in 7.8 seconds but you'll also be able to get a 180 kilowatt version with 400 newton meters for more sporty performance. Unfortunately, a mega five cylinder Formentor will be left-hand drive only and won't be making it to Australia for now. Pricing is yet to be confirmed, but it's expected the Formentor PHEV will be aggressively going after rival small hybrid SUVs, including the Volvo XC40 and Mini Countryman. For my adventure across Sardinia, the Formentor has been the perfect companion. Tons of practicality, I've fitted in all my kit, and it's been really nice to just cruise some of the freeways. That said, freeways are few and far between here, and virtually all the roads we've used have been more driver-focused, windy mountain passes, and for that, this car has been an absolute gem. In fairness, there haven't been many places to charge that PHEV battery, but what this car proves is you don't need to do that every day. And when it comes to road trips and adventures, this is all the car you would need. My adventure from the north to the south of Sardinia ends here, at a military base by the sea. The reason we had to leave the Formentor behind, and that's the end of my adventure in that particular car, is because there's only two ways to get to the Extreme E event. One is in an Odyssey 21, and the other, since I don't have one of those, is a military truck. This is the penultimate round of the 2021 Extreme E Championship, and thanks to the Formentor, my carbon footprint traveling here has been relatively small. But now, I want to find out a little bit more about this extraordinary racing series. I'm lucky enough to steal a couple of minutes with the RXR Rosberg Extreme Racing team boss, Nico Rosberg. Nico, why is it so important to be involved with sustainable motorsport? Um, because I think that there's a huge opportunity for sports as a whole and also motorsports to have a positive impact as well because there's so many fans watching us from around the world and if we can be a really good role model and also get involved in some really impactful initiatives I think it's the right way to go and then we'll be very proud of what we're achieving. And as we've seen motorsport cascades down into road cars this is proving that electric vehicles can be fun and exciting. 
Yeah, that's the other angle. That's why we're racing electric. We want to help shift the consumer mindset out there. So all of you watching, we hope to convince you and show you that electric cars are cool and there's less and less limitation. And that soon to be, it's going to be the new normal because this is the way to decarbonize mobility. Um, so this is also what we want to help raise awareness for. There's a couple of teams here that are using manufacturers as their their face. Yep. Um, is that something, obviously at the moment RXR is agnostic, yeah. is it something that you consider in the future? So dear manufacturers watching, we would very much like to welcome you. Uh, we've had many conversations so far, um, but it's early days, you know, and you want to make sure that we get the right one as well. Uh, so, but the conversation is ongoing and looking good. Great talking to you, Nico. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Jutta Kleinschmidt is one half of the ABT Cupra crew and she's going to tell me a little bit about the Odyssey 21. Now I've been driving around in a Cupra Formentor which has an electric motor, it's got a battery and it's got exactly the same badge as that so obviously it's exactly the same car, right? <laughs> Not really. So oh, for really? Sure, this is made for off-road off -road racing. So yeah. it is very special. And to be honest, except the electric engine and the battery, there's not so much in common. Okay, so it's <laughs> yeah. got two motors for a start. Yeah, exactly. You have two motors, one for the front and one for the rear axle. And for sure you have a battery. This is the same, an electric engine. And uh, yeah, it's full battery electric SUV. Has a lot of suspension, very big tires, you can see. So it's uh, uh, 37 inch tires. That is much bigger than... <laughs> I think it was about 19 inch wheels we're yes. rolling. So a little bit different there as well. And the battery is obviously much bigger because you're pure electric here. Yeah, it's not so much. Yeah. For what you drove, yes, but uh, we have uh, 60 kilowatt hours because we don't go so far, so it's not so big battery. Right, but you use that pretty quickly. What's the range yeah. in one of these? It depends how fast you are and it depends on the camera. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, for sure, if you really accelerate, uh, you maybe can go 30, 40 k. That's it, and yeah. then we're all done. Okay, and then you have to recharge with the hydrogen generated electricity, so exactly. it's all zero emissions. Um, now, what are one of the greatest challenges of, of piloting a vehicle like this? Because there's no one here who's really done anything quite like this before. So this mm. is a different, what are the greatest challenges with an Odyssey 21? Yeah, for sure, uh, you have to get used to the electric uh, system because if, if you have a failure, you have to reset it. Though that's like a little bit like a computer, you know? Right. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, if it's anything like my computer, it happens yeah. a lot, yeah. <laughs> so then for sure you, but this is typical uh, race car. You have to get used to the suspension. You have to set up this uh, suspension, but the weight is higher than uh, usual race cars in uh, cross country. But uh, a part of this, uh, it, it, the driving, uh, it's not so complicated because you accelerate, you brake, uh, you don't have shifting, that makes it a bit easier and you can concentrate a little bit more on the, hmm, on the driving. You make it sound so simple, but we watched you out there today in qualifying and you do an absolutely amazing job. So we're really looking forward to the weekend. Thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. Halfway through each race, the drivers have to swap in this area called the switch. And this is actually a critical part of the race because not only does the car have to come in at a specific speed limit and not braking it, then there's this section where they have to change. We're getting a driver out and in as fast as they possibly can. In this case, Molly Taylor, she's my favorite, swapping for Johan Christofferson. Doing a pretty good job of it. And they have 45 seconds. If they take any longer than that, that comes off your race time. This is the power station for Extreme E. Over here are two electrolyzers and storage units, and they're making all the hydrogen that we need on site. For that, a 40 kilowatt hydrogen fuel cell, and that powers the electricity that goes into the Extreme E cars. Now I know what you're thinking. The electricity that goes into the electrolyzers, where does that come from? Well, this is a start, and ultimately when we can take electricity from things like this, solar and wind power, then we complete the circuit. Sardinia RXR took the final victory with everything to play for for the overall 2021 title. But it's not just a team and two drivers that win with the Extreme E series. There are certainly still a few wrinkles to iron out, including true zero carbon status and a few reliability problems. But Extreme E is an exciting glimpse of how electric motorsport can be brilliant. And with sustainable, extraordinary motorsport, everyone wins.